The choices are dizzying. Cable companies offering phone service, phone companies getting into the television business, and the Internet as our newest venue for making phone calls. And all of that against a backdrop of what seems like endless mergers. How's a consumer to make sense of all this, and what's the impact on public policy? I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is USA Inc. Joining us today is Professor Ellie Nome from Columbia's Business School. Professor Nome is a leading expert in telecommunications policy and serves on the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee. Professor Nome, thank you for being with us today. You're most welcome. We're seeing enormous change right now. We're seeing uh, wireless, broadband, cable industries competing. Can you just paint a picture for us of the landscape? What is going on from the standpoint of telecommunications? Well, technology has been uh, evolving by leaps and bounds, and so we now have uh, personal computers of a power that is much larger than what, what was in the Apollo 11 spacecraft that went to the moon. Uh, in every, in every uh, house, in every apartment, in every uh, student's study, uh, we have television, multiple televisions, we have cable, wireless, uh, cell phones in every pocket, everybody and their children and their grandparents has these. And so the consumption of communications is, has been growing enormously by minutes, by bits, by every measure that you want. And now the question, of course, is has it also grown by dollars, and how are these dollars being split up? And the answer to that? Well, uh, the consumption has gone up, uh, and people's uh, payments for communications, if you add it all up, the cable TV, the phone line, the, possibly the second phone line that maybe serves still the fax, uh, the broadband internet, the, the, the cell phones for two or three people in the household. If you add it all up, it has increased considerably. Even though the prices per minute and per kilometer, per mile, per whatever it is, have kind of declined. If I want to make a simple phone call, my choices are use my cell phone, I can have a telephone service with the cable company. Mm -hmm. I can have telephone service over the internet now, correct? Yes. Yes. What is the advantage and disadvantage of those different technologies for making a, f a simple phone call for a consumer? Well, if the answer would be simple, there would be one <laughs> winner to this. But there are advantages and disadvantages. The uh, phone service over the internet, the VOIP, voice over internet protocol, that is emerging uh, is cheaper. Uh, it may have some quality problems. Uh, it may have some problems with the 911 that are now being fixed, uh, the reach of emergency service. So these are things in transition. It probably is more of a low cost, somewhat lower quality type service. Uh, but it's probably going to be in the future actually higher cost and higher, uh, lower cost, but still higher quality because it will make possible integration with video, with pictures, with all kinds of multimedia services that the internet supports and traditional telephone service does not. Now, mobile phones are great, uh, particularly when you're traveling around, but everybody's familiar with problems such as batteries running out, there's, there's some corners there where the service quality is low or you drop uh, the call. And the traditional phone, you know, it's established. People know it. They know how to use it. It's everywhere. So that has conveniences, too. Now, the cable companies are getting into the telephone business as well. How does that differ from the other services? Uh, cable has developed over decades now a second and very powerful network infrastructure that reaches into almost every American home, or at least passes almost every American home, except in some rural areas. And now they're using this line, this very powerful line, also to transmit broadband internet and over that broadband internet to permit voice over internet protocol, the VOIP. So they're becoming an increasingly uh, important player 
and they've bundled this together with other services such as the video, such as the broadband, in the same way that phone companies are also bundling it into so-called triple plays. And the phone companies are thinking about moving into television now, is that, is that right? That's right, <laughs> because in the same way their wire is becoming more powerful and permits through broadband, which is based on usually on the technology called DSL, digital subscriber line, and everybody sees these ads on television, but also increasingly uh, wiring up networks with more powerful type of technology, namely fiber optic lines, which have a huge capacity. And those technologies enable uh, television. And so phone companies are getting into video, uh, cable companies are getting into phone, and together they're becoming powerful competitors. So is it right to think of all of these industries essentially converging on one another? Is that what's happening? Uh, they're converging, but not totally. The phone companies will still have the primary business will still be the voice and data and business services. Uh, cable is a bit more in the consumer video entertainment business. They will overlap because uh, a bit tends to be a bit information is information, whether it is used for entertainment or for business purposes, but they will not be identical. And so therefore, I don't think that there will in the end be one single winner, one company that will somehow reestablish a monopoly in the same way that AT&T, even 20 years ago, had uh, pretty much a wall-to-wall -wall monopoly over communications. But is this an efficient way to build a telecommunications system? I mean, having all of these different industries investing billions of dollars in different infrastructures, is this, are we competitive with this system? Uh, the question is, is it duplicative? Should we just have one line uh, in, that can do it all? Well. If we knew what that particular technology would be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, if we had that foresight, maybe. But even then, we would have a monopoly system that by uh, its very nature is likely to become um, inefficient, monopolistic, fat, uh, after a number of years. And if you look around the world in the telephone uh, field, in most countries, there was a monopoly. It was typically government-owned and government-run, and it was highly inefficient. It became a place that was more for employment, for um, kind of high, relatively high-cost employment, uh, overstaffed technology, relatively slowly being replaced, a lot of people not having phones. So the monopoly system as a whole has a very bad uh, track record, even if it might reduce um, some duplication. And yet, when I read the papers, every day I seem to pick up another story about a merger, and it looks as if we're getting larger and larger and fewer companies in these businesses. Are we not heading right back where we were 20 years ago? It is a zigzag type road. You're exactly right. So we used to have one company, AT&T, in telecommunications. Mostly, they pretty much owned 80% of everything. Then 20 years ago, it was split up in the AT&T divestiture into eight pieces. Now, many of these eight pieces have reconverged, and we now have two large ones, uh, Verizon and SBC. We have two smaller pieces, but still quite large, uh, Bell South uh, and Quest. Uh, and they now have also the two largest one absorbed the two major long-distance companies, AT&T and MCI. So there is that convergence. But at the same time, we also have the counter trend, the one that we discussed just before, namely that the cable companies become players, that the cellular telephony becomes the mobile communications that is still uh, offered by a number of companies, becomes a real alternative to regular telephone service. So on the whole, I would say there are more choices than there were, um, say, 10 years or 20 years ago. Maybe there are less choices than there were three or four years ago. And is that acceptable from the standpoint of a consumer? I mean, I think the concern with concentration of ownership is that consumers are going to be the ones who are harmed. There's no question that this is a subject of great uh, sensitivity and vigilance. Uh, I think that kind of what we're going to see probably is a reduction somewhat in competition. And that means that the price deals, the great price deals that consumer got, not only as consumers, but also as employees of large companies that have very large 
communications bills, uh, that those great days might be coming to a close, that prices might either not drop anymore, as they have quite substantially, but stabilize or even increase somewhat. And now the question is, is this something that should alarm us, or is this something that somehow competition will take care of? Well, you served on the New York State Commission, the Public Service Commission for this area. Are you someone who feels that these mergers should be approved, or do you think that they should be approved with certain caveats? Well, uh, when we, when I served on the Public Service Commission, we were the first state that introduced local competition in New York, that introduced local competition, period. And New York was, particularly the city, was a logical place for competition to emerge large business users, relatively short distances, high communications density, and it worked actually quite well. And so I'm kind of um, concerned whether, in fact, this will reduce competitiveness. I think that the large business users will always find alternatives. They are attractive customers. That there are other companies that provide the service beyond the big ones. On the consumer level, it is a bit more difficult. Uh, cable television companies offering that service are the one positive thing that I see here that would make a difference. Without cable offering a real alternative, I would be alarmed at those mergers. But since cable television does exist, I like to see this now as a reduction in intra-platform, a platform being like phone, cable, wireless, a reduction in intra-platform competition but an increase in the inter-platform competition, cable, wireless, telephone. And so on the whole, I think we have not quite reached the stage yet where the mergers should be uh, stopped. Uh, now, if cable television does somehow not make it as a competitor, then I think we should really do something about that. You talk about the great deals that consumers have been able to take advantage of, but I think there's a lot of consumers who feel that it hasn't been so great these last few years, that when they call up and they have complaints or they want to buy one service but not another, that there is a lot of market power that these companies have and that they, they don't feel that there's enough competition. Well, the, um, on the, particularly on the local telephone service, uh, competition has been in the past not particularly strong because that required the investment of major infrastructure. Long distance was always easier and I think that the problems that you describe are probably less problems of long distance. Everybody is familiar with these telemarketing calls and the great deals that you get if you mm -hmm. sign up. And so I think consumer had those choices. In fact, if anything, sometimes they felt being overwhelmed by the options and not being able to evaluate them properly. But in the local field, uh, realistically, particularly in the uh, kind of rural areas and, and suburban areas, there were, there were not many alternatives. There was the phone company in New York. It was uh, Verizon. Uh, across the river, it used to be, uh, in New York, it used to be also um, uh, 9X, and then there was Verizon, and the two ideally would have competed against each other. Instead, they merged with each other. And so instead of becoming their own natural competitors, they became their own um, collaborators, as, as you wish, and that reduced consumer choice. We'll be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high-quality, full-time and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate, master's and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Columbia professor Ellie Nome. Professor Noam, let's talk a little bit about the public policy issues um, sure. that this all brings about. What, mm -hmm. what kinds of concerns are there in Washington and what's being done to address them? Um, we've had now for about 10 years, since 1996, a uh, telecommunications law uh, that was um, developed with a lot of negotiations among the interested industries and every stakeholders in the end got a bit, little bit of piece of something. It became a big Christmas tree. It was passed uh, 
almost unanimously, which is always a danger sign. Um, President Clinton uh, signed it, and um, and it was supposed to solve all of our problems. Uh, but of course, it didn't, because one of the things it didn't was it can f actually led to a fairly massive increase in media concentration, mergers, and other uh, forms that actually reduced some of the competition that people had hoped for. Uh, which is not to say that we are back, as some people suggest, to the AT&T, Marbell monopoly. That's probably a bit too much the sky is falling type scenarios. But it's clearly not quite that vigorous um, competition, particularly on the local level, that we had in the past. And so now people are kind of thinking about a new law and Congress is considering a reform of the 96 Act because everybody's unhappy with the old law. The problem, of course, is that everybody's unhappy in different ways. And when they will try to bring this together, it's probably going to be a multi-year process. And in the end, what I fear is, again, some kind of an industry compromise rather than a clear-cut regulatory philosophy embodied in a, in a law. And so I think that's probably the way that Washington works. What are some of the inequities between the different industries Can you, in terms of taxing and, and regulatory issues? See, some of the problems that exist are that we had industries that were in the past separate, such as cable and telephony. Each of them was regulated in a different way. Cable was often regulated uh, by local municipalities and a franchise system that had to pay 5% of their revenues. Telephone was that to... Um, had a service requirement that had to serve everybody. The prices were relatively regulated by state utility commissions. And they had to offer their services, the network, on a common carrier basis to everybody who wanted to use them without any ability to select the customers. And now as these industries are converging with each other in somewhat providing each other's type core business, uh, the question is, can one harmonize these various approaches? Uh, or should one have the lowest common denominator regulation? Um, or should one kind of ratchet regulation up to a higher standard, uh, public interest standard, for example? Those are the debates. On the taxation side, for example, telephone bills are fairly heavily uh, taxed, as anybody who kind of reads them carefully <laughs> I know. can tell. It's kind of a relatively popular way for uh, local governments, state governments, federal governments to raise money because nobody's going to give up phone service because the phone tax has gone up by 2%. And, um, and cable is regulated uh, and taxed in a very different way by the municipalities. And so any kind of change means that somebody is going to probably lose a lot of tax money. And that's one of the big contention, contentious items here. Uh, New York City, for example, does it stand to lose in this? Is this going to be an important issue? I think that if my predictions that in the end, any legislation or legislative reform that will cost municipalities, whether it's New York or, or Istanbul or Ohio or whatever, is not going to politically be viable, and therefore it's not going to happen. Uh, so, so I don't think New York will lose, or certainly not lose much. One of the new technologies that's emerged, the uh, use of the Internet to make telephone calls, that is probably the least taxed, the least regulated. Is that right? And, and what kinds of things do you think should be placed on them? What kind of constraints to make it more of a level playing field? It is not likely that this telephone service over the Internet will have the same kind of taxes imposed on it because it is much more difficult to identify exactly what people are using for. Often it is part of a larger bundle of services where the telephone service could be part of a portal like AOL and so on. I think where there, if there is a kind of a desire to maintain some form of taxation and revenue base for the municipalities, it probably would come with the underlying broadband subscription uh, or the underlying network connect connection, whether it is a phone line or a cable line. So you can get at the physical elements of the transmission uh, rather than at the actual usage that people make for it. Probably the most public example recently of this uh, crazy quilt regulatory system that we have is this 911 problem, the emergency service. Can you just explain for, for our audience what happened with that issue and how it's been resolved? 
Well, 911 is something that people take for granted. They have an emergency, they dial 911, and the local emergency service provider responds and deals with that. If you have a uh, telephone service such as internet telephony, which gives you a number, but you can use that number in New York, but you can also use it when you travel in San Francisco or in Texas. Uh, and it is difficult then for when you dial a 911 for the system to understand where to route that call. Maybe they will route you from San Francisco to your traditional New York 911 number, but the New York Police Department is not going to be much help to you then. And so the technology actually is tricky to do. Uh, and because it was difficult, the service providers were somewhat dragging the feet in offering it, uh, or as they claim, they were going to get it from the traditional phone companies, but they were overcharging them to do so, so there was a bit of a fight over money. And so now the FCC in Washington has stepped in and is making it mandatory, or requiring it, giving strict deadlines. And that is probably good for consumers in the sense that they know that when they have an emergency, they will actually reach somebody to help them. Yeah, that's key. From the standpoint of consumers, what do you think are the key things that, you, that Congress needs to deliver in order for us to feel better about this whole messy system? I think one of the key things is that, particular as video emerges as a way to be transmitted over the Internet so that you can uh, have your television set as it were or your, your monitor be connected to numerous providers of video information communications. The question here is what the regulatory regime should be, the system should be, how you get access to it. Will it be the model of the cable television company where the cable company in effect chooses mostly what channels you have to watch? There are some that are mandated, uh, municipal channels and the broadcast channels, but on the whole, the cable company picks the lineup. Uh, or whether it will be much more open, like the phone system is, where you can reach, or the internet is, where you can reach anybody you dial up or click on to. That is a very important debate because it will define the kind of video, news, and everything else that people will have access to in the future. You mentioned news, and of course, as a journalist, that immediately raises questions for me. How does this, and will it have an effect on journalism and, and the provision of, of quality analysis and commentary? I mean, we've got a media ownership, media concentration issue. Now we have a telecommunications concentration issue. Those two, it seems to me, could blur. Does this present some, some issues for us as a democracy? Well, the, again, the, the problem always is that you have some counter trends and the question is how they add up. On the one hand, yes, you do have much larger media companies, the Time Warner, the News Corp, uh, the Viacoms, and so on. At the same time, you also have emerging with the internet uh, kind of a large number of bloggers and other people who are almost devoid of any organizational big structure. They just kind of do it then they start also commenting on the established media so that the established media now suddenly has reasonably well-informed and well-plugged in because sometimes tens and hundreds of thousands of people are um, uh, reading these blogs, watching them almost in real time. And so I think on the whole, um, when it's, when it's all said and done, the existing media are probably going to absorb these new forms of journalism, uh, and large companies will be still the major provide providers of news, uh, because it is an expensive proposition. It's cheap to have an opinion. It is much more expensive to do investigative journalism, to have expert journalists in the field. And so I think that's not going to change. So I have a future, it sounds like. One last question for you. When we look at the uh, U.S. system of, of telecommunications, are we ahead or behind our European and our Asian counterparts? Is that something that we should be concerned about? The very question that it's necessary to ask that question already points to the problem. It used to be clearly understood by everybody in the world that the U.S. was ahead in telephone, it was ahead in the Internet, 
But then it was not ahead anymore in mobile communications. And now in the broadband internet countries, in particular South Korea and Japan and some of the smaller European countries are ahead of the United States. And um, while it would be an exaggeration to call it a crisis, it really means that since there's so much of a technology multiplier to this, that we really should see what the causes for that falling behind or at least not being ahead are. And the regulatory process, the slowness, the numerous ways in which any decision can be stalled and, and uh, revisited is one of the major problems that we have. Is there any quick solution to that that you can see? Or is that just politics as usual? Uh, I think it's probably, unfortunately, inherent to the legal system and the ability to, uh, to go to the commissions like the FCC, to go to the courts, to appeal it to the Supreme Court. I think that's going to be very difficult to change without a major legal reform of the administrative law. And that's a, that's a long time away, I fear. We've been fortunate to have Columbia Business School professor Ellie Nome as our guest today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York, with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages, is the world's first university. Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. When regulators forced the breakup of AT&T 20 years ago, it was supposed to introduce more competition and make things better for consumers. But fast forward to today's merger craze marketplace, and we once again face a handful of giant telecom companies that dominate the markets in which they operate. Anyone who has ever tried to complain about a service or those endless surcharges knows where the power lies. The introduction of new technologies complicates that picture even further. Internet phone service companies that neglect to ensure proper 911 service for their customers are just the most recent example of regulation not keeping up with marketplace reality. Our current regulatory framework is woefully out of date. Some companies have to meet certain public policy standards, such as funding universal service in rural areas, and some do not. Some are overseen by state and city regulators and taxed locally, and some are not. There is a move afoot in Washington to rethink our crazy quilt system of telecom regulation. The sooner the better. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.